So my name is Lucy Forster Smith. I am a senior associate pastor here as well as one of the areas that I work in is adult education. So I am thrilled to be able to teach this class. It is actually the first time that I have been able to have the opportunity to teach this class. And actually this is a class that I sort of launched. So it's kind of fun to be able to pick it up. Um, so how many of you have gone to at least two of these classes so far? Most of you, and if you haven't, it's no big deal. I'm just curious. So what I'd like to do this morning is we are going to be moving into the territory of the collapse, if you will, and the destruction of the first temple. So we know that there were two temples in Jerusalem. Uh, Rocky uh, Seppinger preached on the, the fall of the second temple today in the eight o'clock service. So that will be a, an interesting sort of note that is under that. But Today, I'll be, I'll just tip my hand right away. This is gonna be an intense kind of session, and we're not gonna probably end on much of a hopeful note. There's a little hope. There's a little hope, but not a whole lot. But part of the narrative of our faith is that we really are always navigating sort of the despair and hope of our lives, whether it be just the simple reality that life really comes to death. <laughs> so we are always have that horizon, but that is not the end as we believe as Christians. So then we move into the hope of eternal life and God's promise, both in our own personal lives as well as for our society. But today we're going to talk about um, despair and destruction as we look at the temple. Now, don't get worried. I mean, it's not all despair and destruction, but these texts really bring us to that moment in the life of this nation of uh, Israel that is working very hard to find its way to God and find its way through a lot of challenges and stress. Yeah. Okay, so what I thought I'd do is start by just simply um, going through qu quickly a couple of, way of the things that lead us to today. So one of the uh, sessions that some of you may have attended was the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. So that was one of the sessions that we uh, explored, and I'm putting these here to lead us into where we are. The new land and the legal code, um, that's what that was about. And then we remember that um, the people of Israel were led out of bondage into the promised land, but part of that, part of that process is the new land. Joshua was a uh, leader and was told by God to go and basically conquer the new land so that the people could take, uh, take hold. So this is interesting because the, what we'd say the theological problem of conquest, I was not here that day uh, in terms of presentation, but it is a challenge to really look at what happens when God, when God smites people or knocks people off in order to create a space for the people of promise. This is a theological question and a challenge. And in some ways, we're gonna get into some of that today as we look at the theology of what was happening with the destruction of the temple and the people moving into exile. And then uh, from that, now I said, we kind of go from hope to despair to hope. So then we get David as king and David um, is uh, the second king that was uh, in the history of um, Israel in its, its um, life together. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what the role of the kings were today, but uh, David is actually seen as sort of the pinnacle of kings. And we know that David was not perfect. <laughs> we know that David had um, some, some challenges in terms of his own person. However, if we know, if we start, we're going to start working into the Advent texts, if you will, once we begin moving toward Advent, and there are lots of promise. There are so many promises that are rooted in the son of Jesse, which is David. So I'm sure that that was an incredible um, uh, session that you all, you all did. And then we went into the full New Testament overview, and then last week, 
for those of you who are here, we talked about the prophet Micah. Now what Nanette did was she basically provided about half the material that I'm going to present today because she really, um, by virtue of the prophet Micah, he sort of, as she noted, I was had the privilege of sitting in part of her class, she noted that the prophet Micah was um, likely that particular text was written at two different times, uh, historically about 200 years apart. So one was anticipating what was going to happen with the people of Israel, the fall of um, Jerusalem, but it wasn't there yet. And so a lot of the early text was challenged to the people to get their act together or something awful is gonna happen. And then the last part of Micah's um, prophecy was really well, now you're in Babylon, you're now in captivity, now you're moving out back in, out of that uh, world and what is gonna happen to you uh, with that. So that was last week. So what I'm gonna do now is I am going to borrow a few of her slides just to remind you what leads us to today. So very quickly, um, the timeline from Moses to Nehemiah, which, um, you know, it almost, brings us into um, today's text. The, I, I'm not gonna talk through it. It annoys me when people do PowerPoints and they read them. So I'm not gonna read all of it, but I'm gonna highlight it, okay? I, I, anyway, it does need to be about me, but I really don't care for that. But you can see here the sweep of moving from the Exodus down through wilderness wandering, entrance into Canaan, period of Judges, and then we move to Samuel, and the reign of King Saul, who was the first king, okay, and then the reign of David, and um, from there. So that's where we're talking, and we're talking, now when we say C1290, that's a long time ago. I mean, that's, what would we say, 3,290 years ago, essentially, essentially, probably more than that. Um, that's a very interesting. And <coughs> what I think shows up even in this slide is that we begin to think that there is this sort of historic narrative, historic thing that goes on with the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, <coughs> that is real time history. And I think that's the first thing that I want to actually challenge in what I'm doing today and have you think about in a slightly different way. It's not that there aren't historic dates that are assigned here, but the real deal with the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, we can call it Old Testament for the purposes of today, is that what really is the, the sweep of history aren't the dates that humans assign to it, but the sweep of God's action in history. That's a very different way of understanding what's going on in the historic sweep. So in every one of these moments that we've highlighted here, there is a move of God toward people, leading people, naming people. <coughs> you remember the, the tender. I, I absolutely love the story of the boy Samuel who's in the temple and goes to the priest Eli and says, you know, here I am and I keep hearing this voice and I don't get what's going on. And finally, uh, Eli says, you know, listen to the voice after three times, of course, listen to the voice because God just may be calling you. And then the role of Samuel throughout that um, historic time was really to um, basically name the king. So if you remember, he also was standing with Jesse and had the, guy, the 11 come out and then said, oh, um, is there anybody else? Because these aren't the ones. Oh yeah, there's that one that's kind of keeping the sheep out there, David, and then he brings him back in. So Samuel's role is one of identifying or calling out and putting uh, God's, um, bounty in the leadership that would, that would come. So um, again, we have, um, then we have key events and persons. We continue on with the reign of King Solomon, who was David's son. So it went um, Saul, Solomon, I'm sorry, Saul, David, and then Solomon. And then the death of Solomon, we know that the temple was built under Solomon, well, maybe you don't, the temple was built under Solomon's uh, leadership. Solomon was 
a brilliant, wise presence, but he veered into some territory that he, pro that he shouldn't have, in, according to God, and ended up being um, basically ended up in pretty much a disaster, which then we pick up in the years uh, subsequent to his, um, his uh, kingship. And as you can see in 722, there's the fall of the northern kingdom. So after Solomon, this whole um, area, of, I'm going to actually move to the map. So here we have, there are two, basically all of this is essentially Israel, if we think about it today. But at that time, there was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Nanette went over this very well last week. The kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. And we can see, we probably know more in our own kind of narrative because it focuses a heck of a lot on what? Jerusalem, right? And so we probably, in, in our minds, think that that was the only kingdom that um, it, at that time. But in about 800 BC, we see that there are uh, two kingdoms and there's a lot of division, there's a division uh, between the two. And the kingdom of Israel has a whole series of kings. Some of those kings kind of cozied up with the surrounding um, territories, did things like abandon God's uh, primacy or, or onlyness, the, that God is one God, and went out and made uh, a lot of overtures toward other gods, if you will. And this is a problem. <laughs> it is not God has very little tolerance, if you will, for that. So we have the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, and during Solomon's reign, they really kind of pulled apart and really became distinct kingdoms in uh, separate separate from each other, but yet, um, yet somewhat connected. So then um, we today are finding ourselves, and the text for today is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Second Kings 25. So it is the very, very last chapter of the um, book of Kings. So there's two books of Kings. So if you want to grab a Bible, um, if someone has it open, could you give a page number for this? It's in the 359, 359 in the Old Testament part of your Bible. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So um, what I'd like to do is uh, just to give us, bring us to today, um, with all that sweep of the kings, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the role of the kings and what kind of happened and how it kind of began to fall apart. But what I'm going to do is to frame that by this, um, this text. So um, would someone be willing to read? Now, I know there's words, that, some names that you might not know quite how to pronounce. And one of the things that ministers do when we read scripture is we do a good fake. So. If you get up there and you're very confident in what you say, you know, that people assume that's the way it's said. But there are also these wonderful little apps on your phone that actually give you the pronunciation of these, um, of these things. So anyway, so if, would someone be willing, what we're going to read, we're going to basically read uh, verses 1 through 7, I guess. Let's see. Nope, we're going to read 1 through thir thir 12. And... I want us to read all the way through the first chunk of this, all, di all the way down to 17, because this is a very graphic um, reading of what, description of what happened after all the kings were basically found guilty <laughs> by God and um, God had had it. Now we're going to come back and talk about the theological role of God. Who was God? What did, why did God do this? Is this the God we know, which is an interesting question. But if someone would be willing to read, willing to read um, 2 Kings 25, verses 1 through 7. Any volunteers? Sue, okay, let's go. Thank you very much. The fall and captivity of Judah. Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon 
came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. They built siege works against it all around. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah's, mm -hmm. Zedekiah. Mm -hmm. On the ninth day of the, the fourth month, the famine became so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Mm -hmm. Then a breach was made in the city wall. The king with all the soldiers fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls by the king's garden, though the the Chalde, Chaldeans mm -hmm. were all around the city. They went in the direction of the Arabah, Ara Ara but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered, deserting him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Radba, who passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, mm. then put out the eyes of Zedekiah. They bound him in fetters and took him to Babylon. This is heavy stuff, oh, that is really heavy. heavy stuff. Okay, let's keep going. Now we get to, uh, it's quite heavy. Let's keep going. I was dealt this deck. I did not <laughs> ask to <laughs> teach this class. Let's keep going. Yes, Ted, could you pick it up at eight and read down to 12? Sure, in the fifth month, on the 17th day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, somebody, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the King of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. All of the army of Chaldeans, who were there with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard carried into exile the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had defected the king of Babylon, all the rest of the population. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest people of the land to be vine dressers and tillers of the soil. Okay, somebody else want to read 13 through 17. Anybody else? Larry? The bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord as well as the stands and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord. The Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. They took away the pots, the shovels, the snuffers, the dishes for incense, and all the bronze vessels used in the temple service, as well as the fire pans and the basins. What was made of gold, the captain of the guard took away for the gold, and what was made of silver for the silver. As for the two pillars, the one sea in the stands which Solomon had made for the house of the Lord. The bronze of all these vessels was beyond weight. The height of one pillar was 18 cubits, and on it was a bronze capital. The height of the capital was three cubits. <coughs> Lattice work and pomegranates, all of bronze, were on the capital all around. The second pillar had the same as the last one. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Well, in there for now. Um, so you, I, I think it's kind of hard to imagine, but maybe not, and I want us to go here, what it was like to have the glory of God literally shining forth in this temple. What was it like to have the glory of God shining forth in this temple? I think it's very hard to understand um, how people begin to put together temples and um, beautiful edifices until we walk into our own. <laughs> we walk into our own every Sunday here at Fourth Presbyterian Church and we look around at the detail, the thoughtful detail of this particular, if you will, edifice, but, also, but a church to, that is built literally to the glory 
of God, and it's hard to imagine. But then think about a world where there weren't a lot of these kinds of edifices, these kind of temples, and also how God opened the way for Solomon to build this temple. Now, the temple was not built without problems, problematic. There was a big problematic with the way the temple was built because, like so many of the, of the cathedrals in Europe and other places, it was built with slave labor. So there's a kind of anger that is underneath a lot of what goes on, what appears to be kind of a mean thing to do, go over and destroy the temple. But there was a lot of, in the Middle East at this time, a lot of very, a lot of upset about the way the temple is built. And then Solomon kind of shook it in their face after it was finished and kind of went back and and basically said, well, you think it was bad what we did to you building the temple. We're going to continue to do that and do some other things, too, to the slave labor of that time. So this is, this is not a pure project in the sense of the way that it was built, but it is, a, if you will, a pure project in the glory and the kind of symbolic of what the temple was for those people, which really was, in their way, kind of the residence of God. I mean, it really was a place where you would go, the holy of holies, the place, the, the center of God. Um, so we see in what we just read that the city was burned, the wall was destroyed. Um, it, it really was a pretty bad, situation. So I thought it might be helpful just to give us a biblical context for this. I've kind of given you more of the historic sweep and also kind of some of the players in this, but it might be helpful to understand what it was. And I've mentioned um, Samuel first called for the purpose of launching the mon uh, monarchy. Actually, God was very reluctant to agree to a kingship. And there's actually a conversation between Samuel and God about even putting a kingship in place. And, you know, Samuel is warned by, he's, he's getting badgered by people in this new um, land, if you will, to, well, now that we've got the land, let's establish some kind of a government. And so let's put this kingship in place. But God is reluctant because God kind of saw what probably would happen, which did. Um, and, but God eventually agreed and agreed for um, Samuel to uh, name Saul as the first king. And Saul actually, as the first king, he wound up really being mentally ill. So if you want to read about Saul, just slide right in there. <laughs> he had, he started out pretty good as a king and then veered off into his own uh, sort of paranoia and fear and a lot of um, difficulties and um, wound up then, um, it, it wound up that once Saul <laughs> had his problems, um, Samuel is asked to find the boy David. And he did, went out, as I said earlier, talked to Jesse about his sons, was told to go there, and then found, and then David became. And the reign of David, as I said, was the highest expression of a king under the rule of God at that time, and a precursor to Jesus, who is in that line, okay? Jesus in the line of, of Jesse. And then after David's reign, uh, Solomon assumes the throne and builds a temple. So the reason I went back to First and Second Samuel, this is in the, bi in the biblical narrative before it. Now, I'm, I'm not assuming that you all have spent a lot of time reading <laughs> these, these narratives, the Samuel narrative, or the First and Second Samuel, and then moved into First and Second Kings. Um, this is not kind of uh, the the popular preaching text necessarily, but there are some in there. But honestly, have anybody ever heard a sermon preached on what I'm talking about today? Um, the destruction of the temple and all the kind of 
horrors of that? I don't think so. I actually had fun thinking about preaching a sermon on this, but no, you know, it's okay. Shannon, uh, just maybe just mention it, but didn't go into it in detail. Probably. I mean, people kind of, you know, mention it because it's obviously a very no, key. Yeah. Thank you for that. So then we move to first and second Kings. So we have first and second Samuel, which is sort of the narrative of how we got the kings named and appointed. And then in first and second Samuel, we have the death of David. We have the uh, accession or the um, assuming of the kingship by Solomon. We have, as I've said, the building of the temple in Jerusalem, Solomon's downfall. He had a lot of women, I can tell you. He had something like, I mean, I'm, I could, find the exact quote, but it was something like 150 wives and like 80 concubines. And these were not all uh, in that territory. They were not all the people of Israel. So he was, he was what we might say a pretty busy, pretty busy man building a temple and a lot of other activity. A concubine, it would be someone who is available for sexual engagement with a um, man. So sort of like a, a, what would you call it? A prostitute? No, not a prostitute, but more a, like a mistress in our time, I think, would be probably the close. Is that right? I mean, yeah. I'm kind of shooting from the hip here on this one because I didn't look up concubine uh, in this. But, you know, and it was probably a lot of, go ahead, Ted, yeah. Interestingly, I don't think that was unusual no. in that time. In China, oh, okay. yeah. same thing. Mm -hmm. South America, yeah. same thing. Uh, so somehow that was the formula for kings, I guess, or the chief poobah of whatever realm <laughs> have, this, have enormous uh, harems slash concubines slash whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, strangely, but that was kind of the times. Yeah, and I don't, what I don't know, it'd be interesting to do a whole session on concubines. It would be actually quite interesting, only in the sense of trying to understand what was behind that, because was it just sexual outlet? Was there some kind of, you know, sexual activity that went on in groups? I mean, we don't know a lot of that, but a lot of people have done work on this, or was it to ensure the next generation of kingly you know, people? So you think about Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, and you know, the worry that Sarah could not have a child, so we have Hagar, who, and no one, you know, it's just like, that's the deal. You know, you need to make sure, you know, if the promise came, you know, what, what God was doing. So anyway, so then uh, moving what happened in uh, First and Second Kings, we begin to see the importance of the role of the prophet. And the prophet is not the king. The prophet stands with, um, the prophet stands as the mouthpiece of God often to the kings, especially when the kings are veering off into territory they shouldn't be veering off into. So the role of the prophet is really the one who draws the king back into, um, in, into purpose and meaning. So I thought it might be kind of interesting to read just a little bit of, just to give you a feel for what a prophet might do um, in, the, in the sweep of um, the relationship. So I wanna, the relationship with the king. So who, I'd like to read a little bit of Frederick Buechner, my favorite you know, writer who wrote this book called, I commend it to you, Peculiar Treasures, A Biblical Who's Who, so that you can, you can keep track of um, who a lot of these people are. But um, this is a wonderful kind of bringing it down on the ground to say these are the kind of people who were standing alongside of kings, but challenging them to make sure that they were finding their way into um, God's realm. So if, what do you remember, does anybody have any memory, or do you know what um, Elijah, what he would be the most famous for in the Hebrew Bible? Anybody? Pardon? The, it, so you remember, I, my daughter loves Veggie Tales, <laughs> which is that little kid program and and in there there is this whole thing about Elijah and the contest on Mount Carmel 
And if you remember, it was a time of great da uh, drought. Yeah. And there was this thing about, can your God, Baal, Baal um, be able, in a contest with Yahweh in terms of who could create or produce rain. So I'm just going to read a tiny bit of this. But in the contest between Elijah and the prophet Baal, to see whose God was the real article, Elijah won the first round hands down. Starting out early in the morning on Mount Carmel, the prophets of Baal uh, pulled out all the stops to get their candidate to set fire to the sacrificial offering. They danced around the altar until their feet were sore. They made themselves hoarse, shouting instructions and encouragement at the sky. They jabbed at themselves with knives, thinking the sight of blood would start things moving, if anything would, but they might as well have saved themselves the trouble. Although it was like beating a dead horse, Elijah couldn't resist getting a few digs in. Maybe Baal's flown to Bermuda for the weekend. This is Frederick <laughs> Beekner. Or maybe he's taking a nap. The prophets whipped themselves into greater and greater frenzy under his goading, and by mid-afternoon, the sacrificial offering had to begin to smell a little high. And there was still no sign of fire from above, and then it was Elijah's turn to show what Yahweh could do. He was like a magician getting ready to pull a rabbit out of a hat. First, he dug a trench, a trench around the altar and filled it with water. Then he got buckets. Now, this was getting fire, not rain, but it is interesting. Then he got the bucket brigade going to get the offering a good dowsing. Then as soon as they'd finished, he'd gotten them to do it again for good measure. And by the time they'd finished the third go round, the whole place was awash. And Elijah looked as if he'd just finished swimming the channel. He then gave Yahweh the word to show his stuff and jumped back just in time. Lightning flashed, the water in the trench fizzled like fat on a hot griddle. Nothing was left of the offering but a pile of ashes and the smell of 4th July. The onlookers were beside themselves with enthusiasm at the sight of Elijah's demolished the losing team down to the last prophet. No one could say whose victory had been better, Yahweh's or Elijah. So Elijah as prophet, had this power of God engaging, not only speaking through, but engaging through. So can you imagine being in a king at that time and having the prophet standing behind you, sorry, sorry Fred, I'm moving out of the, the range here, standing behind you and basically not just whispering in your ear, but shouting in your ear that this is the word of God. This is what God's purpose and God's way is. So these prophets, so I hope that this whets your appetite to go back and read these two books, uh, the first, bo all four books, the Samuels and then the Kings, because it's really fascinating what you see as the kind of narrative um, through them. So we have the role of the prophet, we have Elijah and Elisha who came after him. We have the downfall of the northern kingdom, um, Ahah Ahaziah, I guess, Ahaziah, uh, the king, and then the downfall, now that we read this morning, of the destruction of the temple and the kingdom is gone. So uh, real quickly, I'm going to spin through this because what I really want to get to is what I love the most, which is the theological questions behind this. And that's why we're at tables, because I'm going to prompt you with a couple questions to really look at the question of who is God in a situation of judgment and also a God in a situation of mercy? So uh, again, um, the story of the fall of Israel, the fall of Judah, the capture and destruction by Nebuchadnezzar, who was no kind soul. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. Um, so here are the questions that begin to come up as we are beginning to approach these texts in the wider sweep of the biblical narrative. Why was the monarchy so important and why was the temple's destruction so devastating? That's the essential question. It should have been the first plate up here. I put it buried it a little later. But that's the question, the two questions. Why were these? And then we talked a little bit about the history. Is it a history book? If so, why do these issues matter today? Why are we even studying this right now here in terms of the world that we're inhabiting today? Is this the narrative, I'm sorry, I am reading the PowerPoint. Is this the narrative of the people unrelated today? Why does it matter? 
Um, and then the question, the real question is, from what we saw then, what do we see showing up today that might be parallels or might sound like somewhat similar world that we're inhabiting? And it doesn't take you long to begin to think about big destruction that has happened over the last, the millennia, but particularly in the 20th century in um, Europe with, and, you know, it, with uh, World War I and II. And then the interesting world we're inhabiting now where a lot of the ancient um, relics and uh, temples and various even symbolic, beautiful uh, statuary and other things are getting destroyed even as we speak today. So what's, what's going on? So then the theological questions uh, are, you all know what theology is, study of God. So where is God in this situation? How, what are we learning about God's engagement with the people? Um, you know, we have Jonathan uh, Edwards, who um, was a preacher in the early part of the, this, um, this country's life, who, who basically got up and preached a very famous ser sermon called Sinners Before an Angry God. You know, is that really the message of the, of the gospel? For our time, you can talk about that. <laughs> but I think it's a, a fascinating sort of re rehearse of what happened. King's massively messed up. So, the Bi so now what we're going to do is shift from the Bible then to the Bible now. I just did that kind of bridge over into the Bible now. So how does this apply to our lives? What is devastation and destruction? in our lives, what are the moments, and what is ending and loss? What are the, what's the narrative of the 25th, 21st century in terms of ending and loss, and what is the horizon of hope? That's where I would love for us to end. What the heck? Okay, this is interesting. Got little, got little, yeah, like that yeah. <laughs> wasn't that fun? That kind of made you seasick, didn't it? Okay. <laughs> Anyway, I accidentally hit the wrong, I hit the up button instead of the forward button. So what I'd like for you to do now, if you're willing, do you have any questions, first of all, about anything I've said? Anything, just kind of the sweep of the narrative? Not really, okay. Yeah, Ted. I kind of have a, um, could you remind me and us of, the kings came to be because there was dissatisfaction with the judges, was that yes. kind of it? Okay. Yes, exactly. Yes, so the judges were there, the judges were, so there's, again, in the, in the books of the Bible, if you just look at your index, you can see that we have Joshua, Judges, then we move to Samuel, then we move to Kings, so exactly. So there was, and the role of the judges, has anyone really in this narrative, in this uh, series talked about judges, the judges and their role? kind of mentioned, but not, not really went into it. And I'm not honestly prepared to talk a lot about that today, but you're right, Ted, that, that it was, that there was a dissatisfaction with, um, with judges who were appointed by God, but it wasn't working in the way of what I suspect was true at that point is it's kind of like king envy. So we're looking at all of these other nations. Everybody else had one, so we want one too and God warned them that there could be all sorts of problems, which ended up happening and the whole thing kind of went to fallow. And so it went to fallow and God got so disgusted. There was one king in the series, Josiah, who really was a king that tried really hard to turn the ship around, but it was so far, it, so much had happened and it was so, so bad that God just got really disgusted and just said, you know, there's, there's really not much that I can really do to turn, not much you can do to, to turn the ship, you know, in terms of, in terms of that. But I think God was also afraid that maybe the kings, too, would develop their own ideas yes. as human beings, yeah. and God did not like that either. Right, right. And so that was, again, thank you, Sue, and that was, again, that role of the um, prophets to continuously bring back the kings. I mean, you know, because it's really easy. You can imagine, I mean, 
you know, we see it in our own leadership politically in this country, not only the one, the one the president now, but even in the past, there's a lot of power does some very interesting things and power and, um, you know, and also wealth does some interesting things to people, not only in the, in the uh, leadership, but also down the ranks. So we see it, we're not naive to that. So um, what I'd like to do now is to suggest that you spend about 15 minutes around your table with some questions that I'm going to put up here. And what I'd like to do is simply give your table the opportunity to um, discuss either theological questions that look are of interest to you, and I'll kind of give you a thing on that, or the contemporary life. Um, situations that might be of interest and we're going to report back real quickly so here's the one here you can read them but um, basically the theological questions have to do with who is God and what is God's activity in these things and God did more God kept kind of working with the kings challenging them asking them to return to God don't go whoring after other um, pouring after other gods, but stay true to God's uh, commandments. And um, it just continued to veer off into difficult, not good territory. So here are the questions for today. Is there any place for God's judgment in our lives today? We are, a, as Christians, very keen on grace, not in the, in the recent years, at least in mainline Protestant we don't spend tons of time on judgment and on law. I mean, we, we certainly have standards, and we certainly have ways that we engage uh, in the, the moral life that God puts into our, the fiber of our being. But really, you know, for most of us, the way that we understand Jesus is the word of grace, pri pri uh, primarily. But it raises a question, have we kind of gotten away from uh, a sense of, is God a God of judgment and holding people to account? So I think this is a, both in uh, systems as well as individually. Do you believe, and the second question is, do you believe God is shaping history in our time? And is there a connection between Jesus' life and the devastation of the first and second temple? So, you know, Jesus talks about, you know, basically I will be destroyed and three days later I will be raised up. You know, my body will be destroyed, but I will be raised up. There's all kinds of texts about that. But you can talk a little about that if that's of interest. And then the last two questions are, where in history have there been situations of total devastation? What has come of that? And how does your faith address those moments? Okay, so those are the questions I have that I really want you to discuss at your tables. If you are at a table with a couple of people, you might want to join another table and you decide what of those questions kind of grabs your, grabs your, in light of everything else I've said, okay? All right, everybody, if we could uh, real quickly just, what did you talk about? What did you talk about? I, mean, I was here, so I know what you talked about, but what did you talk about? Over here, what were the more what the what were the kind of persistent sort of questions that came up around this time? We talked about the first question, and we were talking about whether you have to be repentant to have God's forgiveness. That's one thing. And we sort of thought that things are tilted sort of towards grace versus the eventual judgment of God in our current teaching. So, what is required of grace, if anything? And, and so, does it trump it? Don't use that word. Does it overcome everything? Yeah. If we own that word, yeah. the whole new way. And also, I think one of the things, my insight out of our discussion over here was that, at least for me, that why are we looking at these narratives when we have this whole narrative of grace in the new testament you know with jesus coming and being sent but i think what we need to realize is what was going on in the sweep of history that led to that moment when god sent jesus into the world to redeem the world to be to find the lost to you know, and you look at these texts, these stories from the Hebrew Bible, I think it really does help us realize that there was 
a lot of problems <laughs> in, the, in the history of this tradition and that God did God's best, tried to do the best God could to be able to you know, manage the issues. And finally, in the end, as we say, this was the instance in which God really said, I'm gonna basically send my only begotten son. Okay. So what happened at this table? Which, what did you talk about? Were there any questions or anything come up? That was compelling. I talked about the first question too, and I was saying that I didn't often think about judgment anymore. I tend to focus on the grace part, which you brought up, which I thought was a good point. And Karen, you had a really good point about that. Oh, well, we talked about how um, God was um, leading them as a people not to think of their faith and grace in terms of a physical building that that had to go away. It was necessary to go away and to realize that they needed to have a deeper understanding and compassion towards humanity. And we talked about how, but you know, that evidently has changed because we don't ordinarily see people's eyes put out and people's children, you know, destroyed before them uh, as a matter of course anymore, that we have, humanity has evolved and we have to keep evolving and looking for that to open our hearts towards them. The yeah. fact that God yeah. has made the decision uh, to send Jesus, uh, his only son, down to earth because he loved us so much, God, that he wanted to show us as human beings uh, how much he loved us by being able to identify with us because of the incarnation. Yeah. I wish I could have expressed that this way with our group. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. It's beautiful. This beautiful. The Thank you. Thing. Yep. Yeah. What else did your... Anything else that your group talked about? Which did you take one of these questions or a couple of them? Them answers to all of You them. grabbed all of them? Wow, you're an ambitious circle. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talked a little bit about um, God's judgment is not necessarily being um, all and accurate. Um, and I think that that's something that we need to be really mindful of. Um, and that's what we talked about at the table. We do punish ourselves. That's what, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we did mention that. <laughs> well, I hope that this has been, you've been able to kind of get a window. Uh, now, there's an interesting way that this chapter, uh, 2 Kings 25, ends. And it's apparently pretty contested in terms of the way it ends. But I want, I'm going to just close with, um, <clears throat> starting at verse 27. And I'm going to read it to you and just leave you with a question. So here we are, we've gone through this destruction, it's so terrible, we had terrible things happen. Uh, then in the 37th year of the exile of King Jehoiachin of Judah in the 12th month, they always wanna name the months on the 27th day of the month, so we've got a time, King Evil hyphen Merodach of Babylon, isn't that an interesting name? Yeah in the year that he began to reign, released King Jehoiachin of Judah from prison. So he had been in prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above all other seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. And Jehoiachin put aside his prison clothes and every day of his life he dined regularly in the king's presence for his allowance, a regular allowance was given to him by the king, a portion every day as long as he lived. Could we spend a minute on that? What do you make of it? You think he's a puppet? Is he a puppet king? Is he just sort of like, well, oh, that's nice. Is it they couldn't handle, the writer of Kings just couldn't end it with destruction and death and had to get some kind of a some kind of a window into another reality. I'm curious. Anybody know? Anybody? I Those know. are sort of the two narrative, uh, the two understandings that come out of this is that it could just be window dressing. You know, people are saying, well, it's a nice thing to maybe have happen. But it also could be that this is a glimpse in the exile of someone being drawn back into the fold, if you will, even if it was done in a disrespectful or kind of a, a put down way, you know, a kind of sarcastic, I, I hear a little 
maybe sarcasm in this, but what is this about? What is this about? And I'm going to kind of I'm going to leave you with that question and not attempt to answer it. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your energy and your interest. And next week we will pick this up with Psalm 137. Judy Watt will be uh, leading us next week. So I know it's not quite Thanksgiving yet, but anyway, thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.